Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, wherever you might be in the world today. Thank you for joining our discussion, Training an Effective Global Leader Here, Wharton's Perspective. My name is Alex Baran Perea. I am uh, one of our co-founders here at Ivy Exec, and it is a true pleasure to have Ivy Exec host today's session. And I'm honored to be joined by Peggy Bishop Lane and Brian Bushy of the Wharton School for a discussion that I know is very important to, to all of us and that is about effective global leadership and the development and the importance of participating in learning environments that provide really rich, diverse perspectives. But before we begin and, and start the discussion with Peggy and Brian, just a few brief housekeeping issues uh, for our audience that's still in the process of joining. Uh, first, as you can tell, you're all in listen-only mode. We wanna make sure that we maintain a certain level of quality of audio. However, we really do encourage and would love to hear your questions and comments throughout the discussion that I'll be moderating with Brian and Peggy. You'll find in your control panel uh, a questions uh, tab, if you will. Please send your questions there. Uh, those will be seen by me. Uh, I will then, uh, as we go through our discussion, share your questions, your thoughts, your feedback with Peggy and Brian and for the broader audience that we have today. Um, this uh, uh, session, this discussion is being recorded, so you can uh, expect to see a recording uh, arrive in your inbox in the coming days as well. And so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And before we discuss uh, the topic at hand, just to give a little bit of the context that I think motivated and inspired us to have this webinar as part of our series with Wharton. Um, as you all know, technology transformation uh, has impacted nearly every facet of our economy. And it's forced many of us to learn new skills and acquire knowledge at a pace that I don't think we've ever ex you know, experienced before. Um, what is sometimes overlooked is that the acquisition of these skills must take place at different scales. And really our discussion today is about acquiring these knowledge and skills at a global scale. And I can certainly attest from my own personal experiences that now more than ever, it's crucial that leaders appreciate the importance of global education, inclusiveness in that mindset of, of, of becoming and, and maintaining that level of global leadership and the necessity to to really operate within uh, a global economy, but one that requires you know, leaders to operate with a global mindset. Um, and so really today's discussion is really to talk about what are the skills, what are the competencies that we believe uh, uh, or could be considered to be you know, most critical to, 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 to really be considered a global leader and where should executives turn to develop those skill sets and those competencies. So uh, no better than to have Peggy and Brian you know, be part of this discussion. I'm so honored to be here with you both. Uh, thanks again, Peggy and Brian, for taking the time. I know it's uh, East Coast, it's early morning, but uh, really appreciate you taking the time to, to do this with us. Thanks, Alex. Great to be here. Thanks, Alex. Great, Great. wonderful. So a um, uh, couple notes, I, I'd love to sort of first start by giving a quick introduction to Peggy and Brian for the audience, for them to know who you are in the background. One thing that's important to note is that our discussion today is inspired uh, by the launch of the new global cohort uh, for the Warden MBA program for executives. Uh, this program, I've just be become more familiar with it myself, has an incredible unique aspect to it. The program offers a blended learning schedule that provides uh, convenience of virtual courses with the intentionality of in-person residential weeks. We'll cover the global cohort as part of our discussion today because many of the discussion points today are really reflected in the global cohort for the executive MBA program at Wharton. Uh, before we do that, um, again, just to introduce Peggy and Brian to the audience. Peggy Bishop Lane is the Vice Dean of the Wharton MBA for Executives and, and, and Adjunct Professor of Accounting. Uh, she's based in Philadelphia, and, and Peggy oversees both the Philadelphia and San Francisco programs, as well as the new global cohort option as well. Uh, but before joining the MBA for Executives uh, program, she directed the academic experience for the full-time MBA um, as Deputy Vice Dean of Academic Affairs for over 10 years. And Peggy teaches introductory accounting to first-year executive MBA students as well. Uh, certainly not something that's my cup of tea, Peggy, so I am enamored when I see that uh, you are a recipient of numerous teaching awards, including uh, one unique one, uh, Tough But Will Thank You in Five Years Award, which uh, I think is very, very well appreciated by those that, that have had a chance to, to be part of your classroom. 
Um, previously, Professor Lane was a member of the faculty at NYU Stern School of Business here in New York, uh, where she was awarded the Eli Kushel Accounting Education Award for uh, excellence in teaching. Um, and your research interests, as, as I know, um, include firms' incentives to use accounting accruals to manage their financial reports, particularly in the financial services industry, uh, which stems from her experience as an officer and analyst for First Republic Bank, which is now part of Bank America. Um, and she previously served on the board of directors for the Graduate Management Admissions Council. So those of you that have questions around that, that admissions journey, especially for the executive MBA program at Wharton, Peggy and her team certainly will be available to discuss those. Uh, Brian Bushy, um, also thank you again for taking the time, is the Jeffrey T. Boise Professor and Senior Vice Dean of Teaching and Learning at the Wharton School. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Michigan um, and is a fellow uh, alum of Duke University where you got your bachelor's degree. Uh, before joining Wharton in 2000, he was the assistant professor at the Harvard Business School and a visiting assistant professor at the University of Chicago. Um, Brian's research focuses on the impact of information intermediaries, such as institutional investors, sell side analysts, and the business press on corporate disclosure decisions and stock market, marking, uh, stock market pricing of information. Um, uh, also, Brian is a distinguished educator as well. He teaches an MBA elective called Financial Disclosure Analytics and offers an introductory financial accounting course on Coursera to over 750,000 students worldwide. So thinking about global leadership and, and global education, I think, Brian, you can speak to a number of different perspectives. In addition to being the recipient of a number of distinguished teaching awards at Wharton, um, Brian has served as the president of the Financial Accounting and Reporting Section of the American Accounting Association and currently serves on the AAA Council. So uh, we have two incredible perspectives from two incredible leaders in their own right. So uh, unless there's anything else to add, Peggy, Brian, we'll, we'll jump right in and maybe start off with a question that I think will be a good starting point. Okay, sounds good. All right, awesome, awesome. So uh, again, for the audience, just for you to know, there's a questions bar. So this question, I am directing it to Peggy and Brian to kick us off, but we do welcome you to share your thoughts around this question. And that question is, as we sort of think about the topic today uh, that we're discussing, we wanted to start by thinking about what are the key characteristics that we would describe are most critical in today's environment for today's global business leader? Um, there were a number that came to mind as I thought about the question. Um, so perhaps maybe, Peggy, can you start us off when you think of today's global business leader, what are those characteristics that you see? And the audience, again, please chime in and share your thoughts as well. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, this is a really important topic in terms of, for educators, but for leaders to think about themselves as well. Um, for me, the most important thing, and one of the things we focus on at Wharton, but I think is a hallmark of most graduate programs, is to train your students to be critical thinkers. And so I think that idea of thinking critically about any topic that you're faced with as a leader is crucial to being able to make the right kinds of decisions as you move forward. So not just taking things as given, really questioning the why and the how of everything. And, and I think that's an important part of our job as educators, but thinking toward the future, toward our students' future as, as leaders is really key. Um, the other thing that we hold dear is making sure that people are exposed to diverse points of view and being open to those. So that's another characteristic of a leader, that you're, you're listening to all the voices in the room, that you're making sure those voices are in the room, uh, because they are really adding something very important to that idea of critical thinking, right? that you're, you're listening to how things are perceived and ways that people are viewing different topics. That, that's gonna help anybody grow and, and move forward as a leader. And then for me, the last thing uh, that I think about, certainly not the last characteristic, but the last thing I think about regularly is not being afraid to take risks, right? That's how you move things forward, is kind of being on the precipice there and. And, and not being afraid to kind of look over the edge, right? Um, that's how we're gonna move anything forward, be it business or science or anything, where you're, you're willing to take risks, not crazy risks, of course, and I'm an accounting professor, so I'm not that much of a risk taker <laughs> myself, but 
being able to, to, to look at that and assess what's the right risk to take, that's really important. Yeah, as, as you were mentioning, critical thinking and sort of that appreciation for diverse points of view. Um, common comments that were coming in were around importance of listening in general, like generally listening um, and hearing what's around you um, was sort of the general consensus that I could hear in the audience. Building upon that, I would also sort of say sometimes it's it's those critical thinking skills should then allow someone to ask not just good questions, but difficult questions, questions that sometimes are are difficult to ask because of the uncomfortability that comes from it. And sometimes those questions are coming from a place of a lack of understanding. So there's this level of humbleness that I kind of feel like is important. One as a leader may not know everything, but they need to be really be mindful about how to deliver and ask those questions by listening to those around them, uh, whether they be local or global, especially when looking at diverse points of views abroad and, and outside of their, their comfort zone, if you will. Um, uh, to, to that point then, then Brian, sort of this idea of critical thinking as Peggy mentioned, um, um, I'm sure you have some thoughts around this as well. So what would you like to add to what Peggy was, was sharing there? Yeah, thank you, Alex. Uh, I'll give you sort of my top three, top three things that I think are really critical in this day and age. And first is the ability to make data-driven decisions. Not surprising from a person who teaches financial disclosure analytics, but we have an unprecedented amount of data out there at amazing granularity. And good data analysis helps overcome a lot of the cognitive biases that we have to make better decisions. The problem is there's almost as much bad data as good data. In fact, there are books written on how to lie with statistics. So back to the critical thinking part, a good leader has to be comfortable questioning the analysis that they're looking, probing the assumptions to make sure they're mm. relying on good data and not, not bad data. And, and I think second, just the ability to leverage technology to work in global groups effectively. So we have the ability now to pull in people around the world to try to tackle tough problems. But the problem is that all of the issues that we have of working with groups in person are exacerbated to some extent with technology. You know, we, we have group think in in-person groups. Now on chat, you can do plus one, plus one, plus one, I agree. And so mm. trying to overcome some of these traditional problems and working in groups through different kind of technology is going to be really key. And then third, it's related to the diverse point of views, just understanding the shifts in cultural norms, both within the country you're in and around the world, especially in terms of diversity and environmental social governance ESG issues. As uh, our undergrad students always tell me, Gen Z is coming. And, and Gen Z is different. We, we have different sensibilities. We want different things. Those students are going to be your employees soon. And so being able to appreciate their sensibilities, what they've brought up, been brought up believing is going to be important in how to work with those uh, new employees effectively. It's an important point that you bring up, Brian, in that um, global leadership is not necessarily just about borders, the geographic borders, but it's also generational. Uh, differences and that differences in perspective, differences in cultural norms come from how one's experience has gotten to them at whatever stage that they are in their career, whether it be a Gen Z or a millennial and and so on and so forth. I I find myself I um I'm a I'm a, an old millennial. I, I'm the same age as Mark Zuckerberg, which is kind of odd to think, but um I wasn't around you know in college my freshman year. Facebook didn't exist till middle of my second semester. And from there, my view of the world changed, right? So so those intricacies generationally are so important as we think about, you know, what makes a, a business leader successful today. Uh, so thank you for that. And, and sort of tying this into what inspired Warden, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, Warden has just uh, launched and introduced the global, global cohort option for the MBA for Executives program. Uh, both Peggy and Brian, you've played an instrumental role in shaping and formulating the design of this program. Can you share more about sort of the inspiration that led to the global cohort, building upon what you've shared? Uh, what made this the right time to launch such a, an option for leaders around the world? Um, very curious to hear your thoughts around that. 
Well, well I'll start and then I'll let Brian add on. Um, first of all, I think this this idea that Brian brought up about technology is, is one of the key features for why it occurred to us. Um, so as we were going through everything that everyone was going through in the pandemic, I think we learned really clearly that you can deliver a very high quality education online. Uh, we were doing it with very little preparation. So imagine what we can do with great preparation. Um, so I think from a very practical perspective, that's what led us to starting to think about this as a possibility. Um, and then as we started to realize the possibilities, what it opened up for people around the world was really key. So, you know, we've been talking about diverse points of view now for the last 15 minutes. Um, wow, are we going to be able to enhance that for our MBA for Executives program? We, we already have a very globally rich uh, population in our current student body, but the fact is most people live and work in the United States. Um, so to be able to move outside of that and offer this experience to people who are working and living outside of the US, again, it, it reaches those new kinds of voices um, that I think will just add the perspective to the people in the classroom, as well as to our faculty. Great. Brian, mm -hmm. any, could you add to that? Yeah, it, it, what, what we see in our full-time MBA program is people come here for two years and they come here from around the world. And so it's this big sort of mixing bowl of different viewpoints and different cultures, um, different thoughts. And, and as Peggy said, with the executive MBA, where you come to campus every two weeks in Philadelphia or San Francisco, it's a much more limited geographic area. So, so I think the hope is that we could replicate this kind of cultural exchange that we get in the full-time MBA program through an executive MBA program by leveraging our ability to now deliver virtually. I think um, as, as a business leader, I found myself during the pandemic, as Peggy mentioned, trying to figure out how to manage an organization in a much different manner, um, in, in a way that I didn't know before. And I found myself doing things I never even considered. And I think that was the case for all of us, of course. Um, it required a new mode of learning, intricacies of managing, communicating, negotiating, um, all these things that I found myself needing to do that I would normally do in person. Now I had no other option than to get on a Zoom and to engage and build relationships in a meaningful way virtually. Um, and I found myself doing that sort of in a way that I felt like, gosh, I, I feel like there, I wish there was a way that I had like on the job training or training that I could then apply to what I'm doing. I don't know how to negotiate certain ways without being in person. I've never had a chance to do that, but now I'm forced to in the pandemic. And um, having frameworks, having a structure, having other peers that maybe are in a similar bucket, I think is now more important than ever because we will not be returning back to what was, you know, 2019. So, so I think timing wise, I find it to be really interesting, certainly for Wharton to be able to make that commitment to a technology oriented learning mode of, 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 of learning, if you will. As we sort of think about sort of the, the, the bigger picture here, I think the main takeaways of the first question that we've discussed here, what are those characteristics of a global business leader today? Um, of course, as Peggy mentioned, an appreciation for differing points of views. Secondly, Brian, to your point, um, inspiration by technology, embracing technology, um, but allowing technology to allow for an open mind uh, for, for that global leader. With that comes innovation. And then I think most importantly, I think the point that I sort of am feeling is this importance of lifelong learning and that technology enabled lifelong learning is now accessible to us. So I think let's look to cover those four topics in a little bit more detail. And we'd like to invite the audience to jump in and share their thoughts. So the next question, again, for us as a group, but then also for the audience, um, when we think about an appreciation for differing points of view, um, what are those characteristics? If, if, if I am looking to have an open mind and to be open to differing points of views, what should I be doing, if you will? And how can I be more open to those types of 
differentiated perspectives that might not be comfortable for me. Um, as I sort of thought about that question, Peggy and Brian, I thought to myself, who are those leaders that I can think of who I always have said, wow, they they are open to diverse perspectives. They're open to, open to thinking differently. Um, I'm a big basketball fan. So Red Arbach came to mind for me, um, who's a very famous, impactful, uh, 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 you know, I would sort of call him a founding member of the National Basketball Association. He coached the Boston Celtics for, for many decades. At some point, as he sort of got to the tail end of his coaching career, he decided that he would make his captain, Bill Russell, who had helped him win a number of championships, um, a player coach. Um, this individual, who is the all-star future Hall of Famer basketball player, um, African-American, happened to be so impactful in their success that he took that risk. And of course, that took place over years of a relationship having been built. But it was a relationship that Red Arbic cherished so much that he would have Bill Russell, in effect, was an impromptu basketball coach while he was still a full-time basketball player. Um, of course, the, the Satya Nadellas and the Warren Buffetts of the world come to mind. Um, but what do you see as those core characteristics of, of someone that does present themselves as having an appreciation for different points of view? Perhaps maybe we can start with Brian or Peggy, whichever, whoever would like to start first. Brian, why don't you start with this one? Okay. Um, so, so I saw some academic research recently that when people join new companies, the difference between the work culture that they were accustomed to and the work culture at the new organization is a big determinant of their success at that company, which means that you you either have to find a company that has a culture very similar to you, or you have to learn to adapt to a new culture to succeed. And I think that's one of the things that really strikes at this notion of appreciating different points of view, is basically trying to understand why people have a different cultural viewpoint than you have, and then trying to find a way to communicate across those divides. And, and I think one of the powerful things that happens in our program is we run students through the same core curriculum, the same fundamental concepts, but they all come at it from different points of view. And what you do is you get to see the same idea translated with everyone's different lived experiences and just having that broad understanding of how other people view the same issue, what their underlying culture and lived experience is, if you can adapt to that and find a way to manage through that, that's gonna make you much more of a success. You know, I, I also think back to what you, I think you mentioned, Alex, that mentioned that the audience was talking about was the idea of listening as well, right? So if you wanna be open to different points of view, you clearly have to listen to people and, and you have to surround yourself with those different points of view. So um i think about um let's say for example when we put together learning teams um in our program these are student teams of five to seven people we purposefully create them so that there is diversity in the team and that diversity is along all different kinds of lines geographic um you know ethnicity your studies you know what's your experience in school what's your work experience, what industry are you in, so that you're surrounded by people who are coming at these ideas that Brian mentioned in the core um, with a different perspective. And being able to listen to those perspectives is just being open to it. It's, it's important for a couple of different reasons, in, in my view. One, I think it's gonna help your business grow, right? I think, yes, it's it, there's a business case, right, for keeping, keeping those people around you. Um, in addition to just creating a really comfortable work environment for everybody, it, it adds to that ability to be innovative, which I think we're gonna talk about in, in a little bit, and create new ideas in the company. So that keeping a happy work environment means lower turnover in your company, right? So you don't just have to be just a good person, although you should be a good person. <laughs> But yeah. I think you also have a, a business reason for being open to those differing points of view. Um, going back to your basketball example, Alex, 
um, when you were talking about Red Auerbach, I was thinking about Phil Jackson too. Mm -hmm. And um, as some folks in the audience may or may not know, he was the coach of the Chicago Bulls during their dynasty period and then went on to the LA Lakers. Um, and then we won't talk about the rest of what he's done, but <laughs> um, <laughs> he had a unique way, right, of coaching a basketball team and, and a system. And so it's not just the listening. I think it's also, you know, being able to portray that to the people around you, literally leading them in that direction that he could do and being much more successful because of it showing, demonstrating that this idea of taking a little risk to be a little bit different, as you mentioned with Red Auerbach and Bill Russell, um, really pays off in a lot of ways when you are leading in that fashion and listening as well. Yeah, and, and I can, I, I appreciate that, Peggy and Brian. I think you brought up a number of points that, that reminded me of a few things, and that is it, 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 it's beneficial for the bottom line from a business perspective. When we, when you look at organizations that have diverse boards they perform better than boards of organizations or organizations that have boards that are not as diverse um, and there's plenty of research that has proven that one of the things that i always um, try to keep in the front of my mind is who are we hiring who are we interviewing are we are we trying to hire people that mimic us because it makes us feel good that are like in sync with us? It seems a lot, I don't know how to describe it. During the interviewing process as a, as a leader uh, or those that we're looking to hire, we always find ourselves naturally connecting with people that maybe have a shared experience with us. And therefore we feel like they would make a great fit. Rather, I always go back to the Steve Jobs uh, imagery that he 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 uh, had uh, articulated really well better than I will of uh, to create success you have to start with really rough rocks that are different in in shape sizes and roughness and you sort of have to allow them to tumble over time and the tumbling of the rocks the the tumbling occurs because there's differences in every rock structure that creates creates smooth polished stones I always try to keep that in mind is that I, as an organizational leader, need to look for individuals that will um, provide different perspectives that I might disagree with, but it's through disagreement and constructive dialogue. When you have a focused mission as Phil Jackson, Jackson is able to portray as a leader, those disagreements are not conflicts that are destructive, they're disagreements that are constructive. And so I think listening leveraging um, different perspectives and really forcing oneself to surround themselves with others that are not necessarily mirror images, I think is important. Uh, that, that sort of was coming to mind as, as we were talking here around that point. So then uh, sort of taking this back to sort of the, the education level, I as a leader, as I look to sort of build a, uh, an appreciation for a differing point of view, you brought up a number of examples, Peggy and Brian, is there something unique to the global cohort that you're excited about uh, as to sort of how differentiated points of views will be um, enabling or enabled through this option for the program? Absolutely. Um, you know, as we mentioned in the beginning, we, we believe we're going to get a lot greater diversity, um, both globally, but also I would say even domestically, we think we're going to get different kinds of people who couldn't necessarily step away every other weekend um, to be able to do this program. And so just from the, the student body, we expect to have that. Um, but I would also add um, the technology allows different kinds of voices to come in. This is one of those things I don't think we anticipated prior to offering um, an online experience that you know you know who they are right in the classroom they're the people that sit in the front row they always have their hand up you get the same half a dozen voices you know speaking up in every class and as a professor you're like oh my gosh i wish somebody else would raise their hand you know i'm tired of calling <laughs> on alex all the time right so <laughs> um what happens in the online classroom 
because you don't have to raise your hand to make a comment. You, you can type your comment into the chat function, um, kind of like our audience is doing today. Some different kinds of people are much more open to doing that. Um, mm -hmm. And so you'll get some voices that you might not have heard in the in-person classroom, which I think is a really special part of this. And also add to that, you know, we're we're together for two years for a degree, but then we're also together beyond that. Um, so I hear from students that I taught 20 years ago, they'll reach back out to talk about some kind of problem they're encountered. I guarantee that our alums, they run into a certain issue in a country, they can find someone in that country that they know that they built a relationship that they can tap into to ask questions. So it's not just what we do when you're here, but you're basically joining us for the rest of the, your career journey because we'll always be here for you. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, I think that's the part that the longevity, the impact goes well beyond the time that one is in uh, a particular program. And we actually have um, a Wharton alum who just chimed in with a, a thought, which uh, we could perhaps segue into that now, uh, Brian Peggy sort of ties into um, technology um, and how technology can enable innovation. So I'll sort of use um, Mike's question as sort of a way to sort of transition here. Um, uh, Mike asked, you know, I'm, I'm a 1999 Wharton alum. How can we help people evolve from strategic and critical thinking into innovative disruption? So. It's a very good question. Brian, Peggy, if you have any thoughts there, my initial thought was when you asked that question, my thought was Howard Schultz and Starbucks because I think of someone that's in love with coffee. He has a business concept, but really Starbucks is a technology company in my eyes and they are constantly thinking about innovating as a technology company. The, 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 the coffee is sort of the the the, the 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 end product of the technology enablement and the innovation that takes place. So so sort of tying in Mike's thoughts and my thought of Howard Schultz as he asked the question, um, your views of technology. Um, let's go a little bit deeper into that. Perhaps Peggy, you can share your thoughts there first, and we'll go from there. Yeah, I'm happy to. So you know, with in terms of technology you know there's kind of a basic level we all have to be at to function but i would say from a leadership perspective you have to be ahead of that curve right um it, it's not enough to just kind of do what everybody else is doing and and fascinating to me that you you think of starbucks as a technology company we we'll can talk more about that separately <laughs> um, I, I mean i'm not going to break any ground with this idea, but to me, you know, Amazon comes to mind, right? They changed everything about it. So everything about how we shop, everything about how companies sell, and you know, they just started as this book selling company, right? So how do we go from Mike to Mike's question, critical thinking to that level of really in innovative thinking? And um, I think it, it's one that concept of risk taking right so you can think critically and then not do anything about that right that's one thing that that can happen the next level is to think critically hear different voices and then take that next step so how do you do that one of the things that we often tell our students is you know wharton is a pretty safe environment you, you can fail here without too many consequences so Let's get people to thinking that way now. Um, start thinking about a business idea, run it up the flagpole with people, you know, go down that path of coming up with a business plan and, and joining a, our startup challenge, for example. Um, see what happens with that. So the more you get people accustomed to that kind of thinking, and that involves technology, um, the, the more they're gonna be open to and willing to take that risk that goes to the, to the next level. Yeah, and I, and I would just echo that in terms of risk taking and trying new things. I, I, saw, I saw something on Twitter the other day where it said, deals don't get closed on Zoom, deals get closed on Slack. And, and of course, it, it's sort of a joke, right? Because you expect it to be deals get closed in person because we, we close deals in person. 
But, but guess what? You can't wait to close deals in person anymore. This is what, what Alex had talked about before. You have to be adept and have to try all these other technology platforms to try to close the deal more quickly. Um, and so it's just right. embracing what's available, not being afraid to jump in and try the new technology. If it doesn't work, fine, you learn something, move on to the next one, but but you can't just wait for uh, the world to come to you. Yeah, yeah I, I, I studied biology in college, uh, Peggy and Brian. So the, the, the framework of the scientific method has always been in my in my, in my way of thinking. Uh, I don't have a business degree. I don't have a business background. I don't have an economics background of any sort, but I found myself having an entrepreneurial itch. And so without me knowing, and I think this sort of speaks to Mike's point, I, I would sort of apply the scientific method as an iterative way to test out my thoughts and my ideas, knowing that it's okay to have small failures. Small failures inevitably lead to big successes down the road. So I think because of technology, especially now with the way that the world operates with enablement through communication systems like Slack, through so many different tools that are available, the big idea does not need to have to be baked. It can be quarter baked. You test it out, you fail, you iterate, from the failure because within that failure, there was something that probably was an aha moment that you then build upon. So this idea of iterative, you know, we can call it, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, MVP is sometimes thought of it, you know, thought of it, you know, within product development, this minimum viable product type of concept. But the idea of test, assess, learn, and then move on, I think that's that's where innovation occurs, right? It wasn't, this big strategic plan that was developed for Google Maps, someone came up with an idea of, hey, what if we could see a portion of the geography? And here we are now, Google Maps is as big as it is. It was uh, an accident, essentially. Happy accidents occur through failure. So so I think that's the mindset that, that global leaders can now operate and be empowered by. And one of the things that I've heard consistently from our own members that have attended the Wharton program and other peers, you have such a great safe space to test maybe ideas that you're thinking about in your work share it with those that are not anywhere nearly tied to your business but have really great perspectives and ideas and questions then take it right back to to the office the next day that concept that idea that's the magic that occurs when you apply a, a learning platform that allows you to get differing perspectives you know and and to commit yourself as a leader to um, forcing yourself to be in positions outside of just your 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 bubble, if you will. So so that I just want to sort of share that because that was what I was thinking about as Mike was asking that question, this iterative nature that is important within the world of innovation, if you will, if you're trying to aspire to have that embedded within your organization. Peggy, Brian, any, any thoughts to that that you can share? Yeah. Yeah, Alex, I think you just raised a really important point about diverse points of view. Um, because you just demonstrated that with no business training, you reverted to your scientific method and you brought that to, to the table. So, you know, don't put your scientists in the corner and say, oh, they're the science guy, right? Because they're going to bring a different way of thinking to, to your problem solving, which is, you know, a beautiful example of what we're trying to do in the classroom and what um, you should do as a business leader as well, right? Um, so I think that's, it's a great example that you just yeah. demonstrated for everybody. Thank you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and a lot of the innovation is just driven by the new data that's come available, as I talked about earlier. So mm -hmm. you can actually buy satellite images of a company's parking lots for all their retail locations three times a day. You know where the employees park, so you can count the cars <laughs> just to get a sense of how their sales are doing. You can get data on cargo ships, how low they're sinking in the water as a measure of how much, how many iPhones are coming over on that, that cargo ship. Right. And so right. you have to jump in and say, can I use this new data to make better yes. decisions, do, do better things with my suppliers, customers, and, and so forth. Right. And so right. it's amazing what's out there. You just have to be open to it and look for it. Right. That's such a good point, Brian. I, I, I saw a documentary on Netflix the other day about the history of GPS 
And I had no idea that it was military technology. And then it sort of made sense to me after I sort of made the connection, but it was GPS technology developed during the Reagan administration, I believe, and maybe sometime before, probably well before, but it was during that time that it became, you know, from mil private military technology owned by the government to now being available publicly to any US citizen. And then from there, those that were, uh, you know, cognizant of when technology is available, how can it be applied? Imagine if we just sort of think about the use cases of GPS now, it's incredible. I can't even think about the ways in which GPS, I don't even know GPS is part of a technology because it's so embedded when you think about positioning of anything these days, right? Our phones are asking us, you know, to enable location. Well, that's GPS technology that was developed decades ago, but now that's available through our mobile phone, right? So um, to your point, Brian, awareness of what's out there that can unlock innovation, maybe not for the initial use case, but that technology probably has multiple use cases, which are, sort of brings me back to my point of how I think of Starbucks as a technology company, because they're applying technology that's readily available or maybe developing their own and then you know, improving upon what they have built as a core business, right? So, so to that point, I know we sort of talked a lot about technology. At the same time, I think it's important that we know we live, we are humans after all, at the end of the day, that it, it was millions of years of evolution that led us to where we are through in-person socialization, right? And now the global cohort is 25% in-person, 75% live online, which I think is important to notice that it is um, synchronous learning, as opposed to you go in, you go out at your own time. Can you share, the the thought processes that went into designing that that hybrid model um and and what are the benefits that you anticipate as you develop the first cohort going into that yeah so i thanks for pointing out that it's synchronous online learning because i think that's very important to note um being synchronous allows us to still have the conversation that we view as very important <clears throat> it allows that um, sharing of views more readily, I think, than an asynchronous learning would do. Um, you could, you know, with a fully asynchronous, you could just sit there and watch and learn and not really have to interact too much with anyone else. That said, it doesn't have to be that way, but it could be that way. Um, the other part of this hybrid learning is the in-person experience. You know, we, we've heard many, many times from our students and our alumni and, and witnessed it firsthand how important in-person interactions still are. Um, that said, we wanted to make sure that our global cohort had that experience. And so for us, it was very important that we have a number of in-person touch points to make sure they solidify those relationships. We're starting them here in Philadelphia with all of our other cohorts so that the, the classes feel like one big group and they develop relationships. For the global cohort, they'll be in Philadelphia for about 10 days. Then they'll go off and they'll do their synchronous online learning, hopefully building on those relationships that they started in Philly. And then part of the design is to come back really quickly um, at the end of the summer to our San Francisco campus and again, have those in-person interactions to solidify um, the, the relationships that they have. Um, so I think that kind of cadence of synchronous online come together in person is what we were hoping for in order for, you know, a lot of people like to use the word networking. I prefer the word relationships um, that they'll that are really important part of being in the program, but more importantly, after the program. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is this is what a global business is going to look like, right? There's going to be occasional in-person meetings, but there's going to be a lot of synchronous back and forth, putting people on the spot, getting information in this kind of format. I mean, I guess I have more concerns about our programs that are fully in person for two years because I don't I don't know how long that model is going to last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think what you've designed is very reflective of uh, what I think is uh, the the, the the operating model for businesses moving forward in most cases. So in our in our case at Ivy Exec, during the pandemic, of course, we were fully virtual. Uh, the option to be in person did not exist. As we moved into the tail end and 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 in person work environments were starting to open up, 
we had a very rigid schedule of when we would uh, be in person um, and it was broken up to maintain social distancing. Uh, so we had maybe a quarter of our employees within our offices at any given point. Um, luckily, as the pandemic has sort of come to more of a steady state, let's call it, um, we came to realize that when we're in person, we need everyone in person so that we build that culture, we build that chemistry, and in a way, to your point, Peggy, it's synchronous. It's not some are online and some are virtual, uh, sorry, uh, in person and some are virtual. It's we're all in person, then we're all virtual. So we're all operating within the same communication um, mechanisms that are available at any given point while we're while we're working, if you will. So our, our model is uh, two days a week at home, three days a week in person. That blended hybrid model is, I think, the way businesses are going to continue working. So what better way to sort of develop your capabilities than to actually be in a learning environment where you are doing just that and probably learning from peers outside of your organization on how to really make that effective within your organization. So, so thank you for pointing that out. I think it's definitely the view of what I see business leaders having to sort of manage moving, moving forward. Yeah, um, and you raise an interesting point, Alex, that I'd like to clarify for everybody. Yeah. And that is that the global cohort is going to be exactly as you described. It's not going to be some people are online and some people are in person. They're either all online or they're all in person. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Sort of moving into the, the direction, and this will be sort of our, our sort of uh, possibly the last, maybe we'll have a little bit more time uh, beyond this, but uh, thinking about innovation and iterative sort of uh, ways in which we 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 sort of are, are building our, our organizations, how we develop as leaders to think iteratively. Um, a couple of thoughts came to mind as I thought about leaders and if the audience has any other, other names that come to mind. Uh, when I think of iterative leaders that are constantly innovating, I think of, you mentioned Jeff Bezos, I think of Steve Jobs, I think of Elon Musk. They're pushing the envelope, constantly challenging what's what's possible. Um, if we go back historically, I think about the Wright brothers. I'm from North Carolina, so I have sort of a, 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 a special place for the Wright brothers. We think of them as the first, you know, the, the, the first in flight. And, and they thought about having humans fly. And Thomas Edison goes into that category. Marie Curie comes into that category. How is innovation um, fostered, developed in a virtual learning environment? Because I find that being very difficult as I sort of think about brainstorms. How do I how do I engage people to think big uh, when we're not at a whiteboard together, you know, or maybe the opportunities for the the water cooler aha moments are maybe not as organic. Um, what are your thoughts around that? Because that is so important to I think building and, and being a, a a leader that's open to diverse views, right? When when that may not be as organic as it could be in person all the time. Well, I think first of all, you can be around the whiteboard together when you're remote. Um, it's just a virtual right whiteboard, yeah. So we've True. actually seen some really interesting technologies as we're preparing for the launch of this program, um, where it really feels like you're in a room together at a and you're literally at a table, and there is a whiteboard there. So you can feel very much like that. Um, it's not like what we have even here, which I think we're having a pretty nice conversation. And if we put a whiteboard up, we'd have lots of cool ideas to share. Um, but I think you can create that kind of environment online. Sure. Um, you know, when you think about how do you instill innovation, you know, we have a number of courses on that topic. But ultimately, I think it is about sharing those ideas. Um, are you going to walk up to someone and stumble, hey, how was your weekend? And they tell you something and then you have a great idea from it? I hope so, actually, online. But that's also why it's important to bring folks together. Like you said about your office, it's also important to have people together in person so that you're having that kind of interaction. But I think it might you know develop different ways of being innovative um if you have both of those types of technology so to speak mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and I, I think the idea is to not kill ideas too early in the process 
And we mm -hmm. now have technology tools that allow some anonymity. Because um, if you're in a setting mm -hmm. where the, the you know, somebody that with a lot of status or the boss says, this is what I think, right? Then it's harder to challenge that. But I use in, in class this tool called Poll Everywhere, where students can put in comments or ideas that are anonymous, and then they can vote them up or down based on whether they think they're interesting or not. And so you can broaden the set of ideas and, and nobody has any reputation on the line as you're looking at those early ideas because you keep the anonymity there while you sort of build the, the body of ideas. So, so we have a lot of technology tools that we can use to facilitate this that just would have been hard to do in a traditional classroom or traditional business just 10 years ago. Right, right. No, it's. I think what you both pointed out uh, really well for me certainly is that technology can enable these opportunities for innovation that can be complementary to what might be considered traditional forms of innovative thinking. It doesn't have to be a strategic in-person session anymore. It can be organically sort of generated through different technologies. I, I think. I've had so many Slack messages with colleagues where the ideas come up just from the back and forth that happens through IMing in a way. And so allowing for that to happen. There was a question from Chris, uh, you know, to this point, um, if you are at an organization that is fully remote and the opportunity to be in person is not there, um, any recommendations for building culture particularly, um, I have some thoughts I need to sort of flesh out, but for those fully remote work environments, what have you seen? What have your students told you? I'm sure there've been uh, those that are in a similar situation as Chris, where things are fully virtual. Any thoughts there, Brian, Peggy, that you can share for, for Chris and the audience around that? Well, one of the things that, we, that I did when I was teaching students that were fully virtual and hadn't had the in-person yet, was I would set up assignments that involve breakout sessions, randomly chosen, and I'd make sure to leave enough time for them to have a little conversation and get to know each other before getting to the task at hand. So, so again, you just have to set yeah. up the opportunities remotely to allow for the informal getting to know each other before you get to you know, solving the specific problem. Right, right. Yeah, along those lines, I think you probably need to maybe be a little bit more open with the people around you um, yeah. in those types of environments, right? So you're not, you're not shielding yourself and, and you're creating, especially as a leader, you're creating a culture of openness so that you can get to know each other better. Right. I think in, in our staff meetings in the pandemic, and, and for some of them, we've actually continued this into the, are we post pandemic? I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, you know, a little prompt, you know, how was, you, what was the, your favorite thing you did this weekend, right? That mimics the yeah. water cooler. Um, you know, what's your, who's your favorite band? What's been your favorite concert you went to? Those kinds of things that we, we do to try to create that, um, yeah. relationship again, um, with our staff. And you can do those things in the classroom too, with all the technologies that, that Brian talked about, but easy to replicate in an office environment. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, the part that, that you both mentioned, sort of allowing the person to be um, to be seen, not just the professional. And, and I think there's so many ways in which, I don't think there's just one thing that unlocks the person. I think it's a multitude of things that could be done on a day-to-day -day basis if when we're operating virtually. One example that it just came up to my mind because I read an article about it, um, a company, um, was interviewing a candidate and they invited the candidate to bring her son, a toddler who happened to be not in school yet. Uh, the interview was in person, but so she literally decked him in a suit. He had his own resume that she helped him write. And she came to the interview with her child, with her, with her boy. And for the candidate to have the opportunity to have her potential manager be open to her bringing her son along for a job interview, that sets a certain level of openness. It builds the culture right from the interview stage. So culture isn't built once people have joined the company. It certainly does. It, it, you're building the culture with the people you have. 
but at, at the mindset of building the culture virtually, especially is to allow the person to be seen as they're getting to know the organization, including at the interview stage. So that's just one anecdotal example. Again, there's not just one thing, but just echoing what Peggy and Brian said, there are instances where you can allow the person to be seen within a virtual environment. We're not confined to uh, you know, a square, if you will, of that person, if you will. Um, we have five minutes, so I want to be respectful of, of everyone's time. I know there have been a few folks that did send in questions about the global cohort and the MBA program specifically. Um, we'll show a slide at the end that gives you an opportunity to connect with Wharton. Um, we'll follow up with contact details as well. But maybe we can have our closing remarks sort of reflect the final discussion point as well, and that was um, around lifelong learning and how important it is for leaders to view themselves as lifelong learners. And there was actually some statistics done around this and more so so the analysis of the statistics uh, recently where um, there was a quote that I read where someone sort of pointed out that the, the employee of the future will have a job every five years, probably for 60 to 80 years. So every one of those will require skills that they did not learn in college. Um, and so to meet the demands of the new job market, either as a candidate in the job market or as an organizational leader that is going to need to sort of open our eyes to the reality of what the job market now will be. Um, I think Wharton is embracing the notion that learning doesn't stop. Learning happens continuously. Can you speak to that, Peggy and Brian, in your closing remarks? And, and if you could tie it into the global cohort, when we'll sort of close out from that point uh, with the couple minutes that we have left. Sure, I'll start. Um, you know, it, this brings me back to um, the critical thinking idea that we talked about earlier. Um, that That's why that is so important because it sets you up to continue to learn throughout your career. Um, if I think about my own class, I teach an introductory accounting class to executive MBA students. Um, yeah, we learn some of the rules, right? That's part of the class, but that's not the most important part of the class. The most important part is to look critically at those rules. Why are they there? Um, why are they implemented in the way that they're implemented? And what do you think about that? What could be better about it? You know, the reason that's important is because those accounting rules that we learn can easily change over time. And and we, we focus on you know, US GAAP and also international financial reporting standards, but you may find yourself in a financial environment that is different from that 10 years from now. So you'll still be able to critically assess the reporting rules at the time because of how we talked about accounting. And that is how I think you set yourself up to be a lifelong learner that you're always thinking about the why and the how and not just the what, right? Um, and, and again, that's I think what graduate school is about, but I think in terms of an MBA, that's what we're focused on. And in the MBA for Executives program, you know, we are clearly about lifelong learning because we're looking at folks who are, you know, 10 plus years into their career and they realize I need to learn something else to propel myself further in my career and in, in my goals for my life. And so that's what we're here for all about lifelong learning. Yeah, I, I noticed we're almost out of time. So I, I'll just agree with Peggy that the, the, the MBA degree gives you this really solid base that you can then use to learn from your peers, uh, learn from books, learn from videos. Everything makes sense if you've got the solid foundation. Uh, and if not, we're always back here for exec ed if you need to come back in the future. Got to put that in to give my job. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, we appreciate it, Brian, Peggy. And just to sort of echo, um, lifelong learning, if you open yourself to being a lifelong learner, you'll stumble upon the innovation opportunities. You're going to stumble upon the aha moments. You'll have the opportunity to be able to build a global mindset if you allow yourself to be open to learning and to hearing and to listening. And so I appreciate you both taking the time to think through these these thoughts. Uh, Brian, Peggy, it's been a, a very fast one hour, I must say. <laughs> I feel like we could probably go a lot longer, um, but certainly there will be time for further discussion. I also want to 
um, thank the audience for taking the time to join us, those that attended live and those that will be listening and watching uh, when the recording is available. Um, thank you all. We'll, as I mentioned, we'll have the recording available soon. Um, and thank you again, Peggy, Brian. Really appreciate what you and the Warden team are doing with our webinar. So looking forward to chatting with you again. Thank you so much, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Bye. Well.